Okay, we're bang on time, so I'll get started. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm losing my voice a bit. Mumble, mumble, piston party, mumble, mumble. Okay, can you hear me? All right, so I'm Steve Baker. Um, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, in the Ice House cycle, I was the project technology lead. Um, and also during the Ice House cycle, I spent a significant chunk of time working on a significant chunk of what I'm about to show you today. Um, so in this talk, um, we're going to talk about application software configuration using heat. Um, for a start, I'm going to give a, an opinionated view on what software configuration versus orchestration is. Um, and then I'm going to show you the new features that have been added to heat in the last cycle, uh, which enable uh, software configuration. Um, and then finally, I'm going to give a, a quick run through of what it would take to integrate any, any given configuration tool. Um, um, with heat to use this feature. So we've come to the realis realization in the heat project that uh, software configuration and orchestration are actually two different things. Um, at, at a high level view, they, they do have a lot of similarities. Um, you know, orchestration is uh, creating cloud resources by invoking REST APIs. Uh, software config is configuring software by running commands and writing out files. Um, when you model them, there's, you, know, you, can, you can see some overlap. Um, but the problem is when you, um, when you put it together, you, you don't always get the ideal scenario. So, so we've, we've realized that separation of concerns is important. Um, otherwise, you end up with a cat dog. Um, so when you, when you choose your abstraction for, for the, the problem you're trying to solve, um, if you solve one problem first, then uh, the abstraction might not be ideal to solve the other problem. Um, and one of, one, of the, uh, one of the problem domains is always going to miss out. Um, and that also is not a good thing. Choosing, choosing an abstraction involves compromise. So admittedly, um, when Heat started, it started out as an implementation of CloudFormation, and that was, to be fair, a bit of a cat dog. Um, so I'll just show you a bit of a, a CloudFormation snippet here. So we've got um, a, a resource definition. It's defining an instance. That's all fine. There's some metadata. Oh, it's a declarative metadata of software configuration. That all looks perfectly reasonable. We're installing some packages. We're starting some services. Great. Fine. I can live with that. I can look at it and understand it. So we continue to scroll down on this template, and we get this. So we have a user data, which is a, a shell script embedded in JSON, which doesn't support new lines. So we've got this uh, weird quote list join with no delimiter going on. Uh, we're inserting values by quoting out and inserting uh, references to other heat parameters. Um, it's, it's not nice. Um, and finally, the most annoying thing is that it renders as red comic sans. So that was the situation we were trying to improve. Um, you know, software configuration definitely has a needs to be a, a, a well solved problem, um, and Heat needs to enable that. Since we're invoking the cloud resources, which um, which end up running the software, it's sort of up to Heat to hand off the process to, uh, to some other thing um, and enable that in a nice way. So the first feature I'm going to introduce is a configuration resource. So a configuration resource is an API-backed store of configuration data. Uh, that data can include uh, the script itself. Um, it, can, it includes a, a schema for defining the inputs and outputs that that script will uh, produce and consume. Um, you can also specify some tool-specific options, which uh, depends on the implementation. Uh, config resources are immutable and can be passed by reference. So if I have a UUID to a config resource, um, I know I can use that uh, indefinitely as long as it's not deleted. Um, it, it will never be modified without uh, creating a new UUID, so I can, I can trust that. So configuration resources can be used on their own um, uh, for boot config. 
So here's an example. Most uh, Cloud OS images um, these days are using Cloud Init for their configuration. So now we can expose the Cloud Init within the heat template. Uh, what we've got here is a, uh, a special Cloud Config resource, which is a config resource that lets you specify Cloud Config YAML. It's quite nice. You can specify the YAML inside uh, Heat's YAML. Um, so here we've got a, a generic software config resource that has a really sim simple shell script. Uh, up here we have a multi-part MIME config resource, which joins two config resources together into a multi-part MIME message, which is exactly what uh, Cloud Init consumes when it boots. Um, and then finally in the user data, what we do is have a reference to that one uh, multi-part resource, um, and the server will boot and then execute that Cloud config. So, you know, boot config is, is useful for many situations if you just want to do something quick and then um, kill the server. But it's, uh, it's not enough. There's a, there's a couple of disadvantages. One is that um, I don't know if uh, this configuration is complete unless I add some more resources to this template um, to specify a wait condition that gets uh, signaled uh, when everything's done. Uh, the other disadvantage is that if I want to make any change to this configuration and do a, a heat stack update, uh, the only option is to kill that server and start up a new one with the new config, um, which is not always what you want. So really, there needs to be a way of um, having um, software configuration changes that can happen throughout the life cycle of a server. Um, and that's where the deployment resource comes in. So the job of a deployment resource is to map one config resource to one server resource. Um, it also allows uh, input values to be assigned uh, at the, at, on the deployment resource. Um, generally, that'll be to uh, assign values from other resources in the stack. Um, a deployment resource remains in progress until it receives a signal from the server that the uh, configuration is complete. Um, this lets it participate in the um, in heat stack lifecycle. Uh, so other resources can depend on this deployment resource. Um, it actually, uh, when it's signaled, it can also return output values. Uh, so you can depend, other resources can depend on particular values coming out of that uh, deployment resource. Um, you can deploy on any heat action, not just, not just create an update. So we have uh, suspend, resume, delete. Uh, the list keeps growing. Um, so you might have different, different deployment workloads that you, want to that you want to run in particular scenarios. Like an obvious one would be uh, uh, suspend and resume. You might want to mount and unmount your, uh, your volumes before, uh, before it goes to sleep. Um, and then finally, um, you can always get back um, when the deployment resource is signaled, um, it in includes outputs, which is the standard in, standard out, and status code from your, uh, from your server. Sorry, from the, from the deployment invocation. So here's a really simple diagram of uh, the, dependency, de de the dependencies between these resources. Uh, so we have a deployment resource, which depends on a config and a server. Um, but for the purposes of, uh, of what I'm describing here, it, it's, it's easier to think of the deployment actually living inside the server and uh, the config uh, defined outside. So if we get slightly more complex, um, here we've got three deployments, but two of them depend on the same config. So this is a simple demonstration of why we've got two different resource types just to achieve configuration. Um, we can reuse this config. Uh, these deployments can have different input values. So you're sort of, sort of instantiating a unique uh, instance of this deployment in two different ways on the same server. Um, so it gives you quite a lot of flexibility. So here's a admittedly contrived example of um, two servers um, with deployments that have independencies between each other. Um, this stack can't, uh, creation can't be complete until every single uh, resource has um, gone into a complete state. But because of the dependency, they have to go in a certain order. So I'll just demonstrate what, what that order would be in this case. So first, all the config resources would go into a complete state, essentially instantly. Um, it's an atomic operation. It's quite quick. And they depend on nothing else in this, uh, in this stack. So they'll just go straight to complete. Then the servers will go to complete, because they too don't have any uh, 
direct dependencies on anything else. And then finally, the deployments will start ping pong until it's all done, at which point the whole stack is in a create complete state. So here's a simplified example of um, how, how you could structure a, a scaling stack. So inside the yellow box, in this case, is the scaling unit. Um, we're not limited to just scaling server resources anymore. We can scale any collection of resources. Um, but that will generally be um, a server plus the peripheral resources that hang off it, like um, ports and pool members, um, and now deployments. So the deployments will be defined at the same level as the server. And when we scale out, um, the deployments scale up along with, uh, along with the server that it deploys to. So uh, I've already mentioned you can specify inputs in your config and override those values in the deployment. There is actually some extra values that the deployment resource adds to the config that ends up on the server. Um, and that's these uh, sort of derived inputs. Now, most of these inputs are, are really just to help with the um, authentication for signaling back to, um, to heat. So you can generally ignore them. Um, the one which is probably most useful is deploy action, which tells you what heat action this is running in. Um, so you might want to do something different when uh, you might want to have con conditional logic in your config, uh, which says do one thing on create and different thing on different thing on delete. Um, so we also have the get file intrins intrinsic function. This means that we no longer need to um, inline our scripts into our YAML, which is a nice thing. Um, so Python heat client will, uh, will look for these get file calls, um, and it will fetch the content, whether that be a local file or an absolute URL, um, and include that in the um, in the heat stack create operation. Um, we also have initial support for including binary files in, uh, in that. They'll be encoded and, and included. Um, but we'll, there'll, there'll be some extra work in that, in that area. So here's some, uh, some deployment examples. So this one has a uh, CFN init config, which uses a structured config. That lets us uh, declare inline YAML in the CFN init format. Um, the other feature of structured config is that I've, I've got this sort of get input intrinsic function call here. Um, now, because CFN init, init is really quite dumb, uh, one of the things it lacks is an understanding of what an input or a variable is. Um, so we have to do that uh, substitution on the heat side before it, before it gets sent out to the server. Uh, so I'm calling get input here, and the special structured deployment um, interprets that and replaces it with this value before it gets sent out. Then we have a uh, normal software config, which is in the group script um, that specifies what hook should get used on the server to actually process it. I'll explain more about that later. Um, and then we've got a get file call here. It's including check temp foo dot sh. A uh, couple of other things here. I've got I'm naming this deployment 10 and this deployment 30. That will specify the order they get run on the server, um, which is related but not identical to the dependency relationship between those resources. Um, and finally, this CFN init deployment says signal transport no signal. So in this case, um, I don't really care about waiting for that to finish. I don't want to be notified, because CFN init doesn't give any outputs anyway. Um, so that can just go straight to com create complete um, until uh, but, uh, but this one will, uh, will stay in progress until it actually receives a signal. Here's the rest of this template. Uh, server resource, which makes no reference at all to the deployments or configs. Um, and then the script itself, which is using those uh, derived inputs I said before, server ID, deploy action, and it's getting the outputs back to the hook by writing out to a, uh, a known file path. So the result was the name of the output. So really simple. So here's an um, equally trivial Puppet example. Uh, we're including a Puppet manifest. And the rest is much the same. It's a plain old software config, plain old software deployment, uh, substituting some values. Um, server is exactly the same as last time. 
um, and here's a really simple manifest. Um, this one is, is also writing out a file to, um, to get the output back. Um, there might be a, different, a, a better way of doing that in Puppet, um, but we can look at that later. And finally, I'll, I'll show you an image-based example. Um, so Triple O are using software config um, with image-based deployments, which means the vast majority of configuration has already happened at, uh, at uh, image building time. So all the software's been installed, um, all the config files uh, exist and have templates. Um, so all that's required is a, a little bit of data, uh, which has uh, configuration specific to this stack, um, gets defined in a, in a block of YAML, and deployed to a given server, um, replacing input values with values from your stack. So here we've got a, uh, we're building a, a URL, MySQL URL, uh, which includes the IP address of the server resource called controller zero. So the hooks uh, end up on um, the server that you're deploying. Um, they're, they're actually quite simple. They consume JSON from standard in, write JSON to standard out. Um, their job is to actually invoke the configuration script. Um, and they, they, they map the heat software config concepts to whatever makes sense in that particular configuration tool. Um, so for scripts, that's environment variables. For facts, the inputs are, uh, uh, sorry, for Puppet, the inputs are facts. Um, and the hook also has the job of discovering uh, what the outputs are from, from that uh, configuration run. Um, so here's the software stack that, uh, that needs to be installed on the server for this uh, to work currently. Um, so these first three tools came from the Triple O project. Um, OS Collect Config is an agent which uh, pulls for metadata from a number of sources, like the Nova Metadata Service. Um, or, or uh, the heat API itself. Um, it then pushes this data down to OS Refresh Config, which just runs a, a chosen selection of scripts um, in the specified order. Um, and OS Supply Config is a templating tool uh, which transforms configuration structure to uh, configuration files written on disk. So going further down, OS Refresh Config will invoke heat config. And heat config is a script which has the job of going through the deployments data that it has and invoking the appropriate uh, hook uh, to perform that actual configuration. And the results get signaled back to heat. So it looks complex, but every single box, apart from Nova and heat, is, is tiny, really. It's, they're, they're very small focus tools. Or not even tools, they're scripts. So the, the hooks that are available, um, I've already shown you examples of them all. Um, script, CFN init, Puppet, and Golden Image, which isn't actually a hook. I'll just go back to this. Um, with Golden Image, uh, this diagram stops here. Everything below this isn't required, um, because there'll be other um, scripts and, and config templates already on the image, uh, ready to receive the, the new configuration data. Um, hooks yet to be written. Um, Chef, there's lots of interest in that, so I imagine that'll happen quite quickly. Um, Salt and Ansible are interesting because they're both written in Python. They both use YAML as their native format, so they'd be a really good match for configuring with heat. Um, I'm sure most of you know of Ansible as, a, as an SSH push-based tool, um, but it doesn't have to be used that way. Um, you can also uh, invoke it on a local connection so it configures on whatever machine it's currently running on, and that's the way we'll be using it uh, in heat. Um, it's up to the hook to supply uh, the configuration data, and then it just invokes Ansible locally on that. And finally, there is um, PowerShell for Windows configuration. So you can use cloud-based init for boot config, but it would be really nice to be able to um, have deployment resources that uh, trigger PowerShell configuration as well. So um, hopefully the guys at cloud-based will help us with that. So this is a, my best guess at how you would ma map the software config tools 
so the software comfort concepts with various configuration tools. Um, it's a complete guess. I'm not an expert in any of those, really. Probably Chef is the one with the greatest proportion of expertise in this room compared to my profound ignorance. But um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that domain experts with each tool will be, will be helping us write the hook. So writing a hook, volunteers wanted. Um, as I've already said, consumes JSON and standard in, um, writes JSON to standard out. Um, typical hooks we have so far are only 100 lines of Python, so they're not con complex. Um, if, if you wanted to, you could contribute your, your hook to the collection that's al already in the uh, heat templates repository. Um, but there's, there's no obligation to use the hooks that are there. You could, um, you could write your own hook, which has the behavior that, that you particularly need. You know, since it's so small, it's uh, not a great burden. Um, so when you're building your golden image, uh, it needs to have um, a few scripts installed. Um, so Triple O have their own tool chain for building images called Disk Image Builder. So we're, we're leveraging that, um, installing these uh, OS config tools, installing the heat config script, and whatever hooks you actually need. You don't have to install all of them. Uh, you only ins install the hooks for the tools that you're going to use. Then if you like, you can install the actual configuration tool itself. And since you're building a golden image, you might as well install the packages that you need. Or, or you could have a, a reasonably generic image and do the rest of the configuration at, at either boot time or deployment time. So it's quite flexible in the approach that you can take. So I won't dwell on this slide, but I will point out that if you want to check out the, um, the current hooks that we have, this heat templates path in the heat templates repo will um, We'll get you there. So this creates an image, a uh, custom image with all the agents we need, and um, uploads it to whatever glance you're uh, authenticated to. So what about the um, master configuration server? Um, a lot of these tools have their own master server, um, which acts as the single source of truth. Um, with heat configura configuration in the picture, now there's two single sources of truth. Um, so the choices are make heat the single source of truth. You don't need a master anymore. Um, you're still using the configuration tool that you like, um, but now you're getting the values from the service which actually created those cloud resources. Um, by not having a master, you don't have to have the complexity of, of syncing um, heat with a master config values, unless you really want to. Um, or you could go the other way, um, only use heat config um, to point your server at the configuration master um, and then be hands off with uh, any subsequent uh, configuration. So, how are we going for time? I think I talked quite fast. Um, so the feature landed in, in, uh, in Ice House. Um, a, lot, a lot of the work that we're doing will be in the periphery of heat. So it can actually all land throughout, throughout the Juno cycle. There'll be changes to Python heat client, which, um, which gets released whenever it, whenever it needs to be. Um, and there'll be you know, a lot more changes to the hooks and the and instance tools. Um, so we can continue ma to mature and you can make the most of the, of the new features without having to wait for Juno, which will be nice. But there's the odd thing that we will be doing in Juno um, on heat itself. Um, be looking at other techniques for, um, for communication between heat and the server, um, so alternatives to the polling and the signaling that we do currently. Um, we'll be looking at um, using Swift as our, um, as our store for, uh, for the data, so uh, we can take the polling pressure off uh, heat itself. Um, we can consider looking at 
using Marconi as the transport to get these messages out to the server and back again. Um, and we need to find a solution for um, how to get uh, servers in isolated uh, neutron tenants uh, talking, back to, um, talking back to heat, which is a problem that any, any server with an agent on it um, has. So it would be nice to find a solution that works for everyone. Um, I haven't mentioned Tosca yet. So there'll be um, one more software configuration resource type, um, which is action aware, which means you'll be able to specify a different configuration script for um, each heat action, like create, update, suspend, um, and group it all into a single configuration resource. And then the tooling that I mentioned before can, um, can only execute the required config. So this is um, one of the main things we need to, um, to map, have a decent mapping between Heat's model and the Tosca model, um, which will make two-way translation a lot easier. More hooks, I've already mentioned that. Um, Docker integration. Um, we can either invoke Docker by booting a Nova server which has Docker installed and then using the Docker resource to um, deploy things inside it. It would be nice to get uh, software config integrated with that. Um, similarly, um, when the Docker driver is back in Nova, um, it would be nice to be able to obviously configure things with deployments in Docker images. Um, It'd be interesting to think, do we still need cloud in it in that scenario? Um, Windows support, which I've already mentioned, be nice to add. Um, and one more thing we need, um, it'd be nice to be able to specify uh, quiescing workloads. Um, when a server has, is going to be rebooted or shut down forever, it'd be nice to say, please remove yourself from the pool or do whatever cleanup you need to before we shut you down. Um, that's tricky in this model because in the scenario where you do a stack update and the server, and the server resource goes, I need to replace myself or I need to do a rebuild or I need to do a reboot, um, there's two things that happen. The old server gets shut down and the new server starts up. Um, this will work fine for the startup. The update will happen, and then it'll be configured, and it'll be all good. But there's no way of specifying the workload to happen during the shutdown. So we just need to have a solution for that. That's it. So um, if you want to ask any questions, please come to the microphones so that everyone can hear, and it can go on tape. Hey there. The um, um, software config and the deployment resource, is there a way of seeing them um, from a CLI to so see what you have or what are currently in flight in the system? Yeah. Um, the, the config resource should be exposed by the CLI. You should be able to manage it. Um, you're not yet. It's, it's only, only the um, heat client library has been implemented so far. Um, the deployment. We could expose it on the CLI. It's, it's really a sort of heat internal API thing, but there's no reason why it can't be exposed on the CLI. And you could, in fact, um, deploy things to servers that you can authenticate to um, outside the context of heat just by uh, creating a deployment. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Okay, thanks so much.